right. Hi, folks. Good to see so many of you here. So the principles of green software engineering. How green is your application? This is a chart over the global atmospheric CO2 concentration since the year zero. I was born here at 359 parts per million. My parents, in turn, were born at 320 par parts per million, and my child will be born at 420 parts per million. Great, now we all remembered how an exponential curve works, in case anyone had forgotten since high school math. But what that means is that we have been aware of the rapid rate of climate change since I was born, since all of you were born as well. And there is scientific consensus that the amount of greenhouse gases that humans are responsible for emitting into the atmosphere is causing our, our climate to rapidly change. So the question then becomes, what does that have to do with software? But firstly, who am I and why am I talking about this? My name is Sara Bergman. I am an individual contributor at the Green Software Foundation, where I've been a member since it was founded back in May of 2021. I'm also a senior software engineer at Microsoft, where I work with Microsoft 365 products. I'm one of the authors of the brand new O'Reilly book, uh, Building Green Software, which just launched in early release. So you can go check it out if you want to. I'm a Swede, living here in beautiful Oslo, Norway. It's very important to Scandinavians that those two are different, tend to be very unimportant to everyone else, but now you know. So this is a passion of mine because, like I said, I've been aware of climate change my whole life. And uh, I'm very motivated to be part of the solution. So in this talk, I'm going to try and explain the ways that you can also be part of the climate solution. So in the next few minutes, we will talk about the principles of green software. We will talk about carbon efficiency. We will talk about how you measure your carbon footprint. And we will also talk about climate commitments. So firstly, what makes software green? Everything in our industry emits carbon. That is just the way our industry works. Maybe in the future we'll be able to run on something else, uh, like water or air, but we're not there yet, so everything uh, uses carbon. And when I say carbon, I mean carbon dioxide equivalent, which is a grouping term for all the different greenhouse gases based on their, their global warming potential, because carbon dioxide equivalent is a very long word, and I don't have time for that. But for software to be green, we need it to be carbon efficient. And that means to emit the least amount of carbon into the atmosphere as possible. And there are three key ways to achieve that. Energy efficiency, hardware efficiency, and carbon awareness. So the first is energy efficiency. Probably the first thing that comes to mind, especially if you've been living in Europe through the energy crisis the past year, you've been very <laughs> aware of how the electricity grid really works. So to be energy efficient, we need to consume the least amount of electricity possible because electricity is a proxy for carbon. It's not a one-to-one -one mapping, and we'll talk about that in a bit, but it's a very good proxy as far as proxies goes. And you can be energy efficient by doing things like, for example, rewriting your code, or likely you're going to get a lot more bang for your bucks by being efficient with how you run your operations. The second way to be carbon efficient is to be hardware efficient. Because every physical object that we create, especially things like servers, phones, laptop, they come with a huge carbon debt. Because we had to mine the material somewhere, ship them around the world, possibly several times, assemble them, often in very energy intense processes, and then shift them all the way to the end user. So when we get our new fancy server or phone or laptop, all that carbon has already been released into the atmosphere. The thing we can do is to use the least amount of it as possible. So use the least amount of embodied carbon possible. And the typical two key ways to achieve that is to make client devices last longer. Don't skip out on that backwards compatibility or to increase your server density. The last way to be carbon efficient is to be carbon aware. Do more when the electricity is clean and do less when the electricity is dirty. And this is where we truly go down the rabbit hole and you might think this is very sci-fi. What does that mean? Here in Norway, we have hydro, which you may or may not be aware of. 
That means whenever you charge your phone here, it's going to come from hydro and it's going to be equally clean. But if we just take a short hop, skip and a beat over to Sweden, where I'm from, they have a much more varied energy production. And that means that the cleanness of the grid will vary over time. It also varies a lot regionally across the world because energy production is still a very national affair, even though we tend to trade it uh, on the energy market as well. So you may think that this is sci-fi, but actually there are some really big products out there already doing this. Xbox have carbon-aware game downloads. Windows 11 have carbon-aware uh, install updates. And iPhone have something they call clean charging, which also uses a forecast of your local grid to decide when they should charge your phone. Excellent. Now we know the key things to make software green. The next thing is, how do I measure my footprint? Because if you can't measure it, it's really hard to improve it, especially if you have to operate in some sort of corporate world where you have to have OKRs and metrics and targets to reach. And typically, when we talk about carbon footprints, we get a total. Total is very useful for one set of decisions. I'm sure that knowing the total emissions for Microsoft is very useful to Satya and his leadership team. For me, who have four APIs on Microsoft Graph, it's very far away. Any efficiency optimizations I do will not really impact that total because it's so far removed. Uh, so a total can be great, but to make the right decisions for people like us with feet on the ground and hands on the code, we might need something else. And that's where the green software, software carbon intensity specifications comes into play. The SEI is not a total of carbon emissions, it's a rate. And it consists of the things we talked about, conveniently, how that works out, isn't it? So it's uh, the energy that your software consumes, multiply with the location-based intensity of the grid. So no market-based reductions are allowed here. And then you add on the embodied carbon cost. And the things that make this a rate is you then divide this with a functional unit of your choice called R in this formula. And this could be anything that describes how your applications scale. So it can be per user, it can be per device, it can be per API call, anything that makes sense to you. And the beauty of this is it can be used in any state of software development, and it's heavily biased towards action. We want you to measure it, change something, and measure again, and see, did it improve? Did it get worse? Did nothing change? And based on that, take decisions to overall step-by-step -step decrease your carbon emissions. And I said that no market-based reductions uh, were allowed. And why is that? That is because we want to be part of your net zero strategy. So what does that mean then? To understand that, we need to talk shortly about climate commitments. Because as a society, there are a number of methodologies that we commonly apply like overall to help fight climate change, not only software, but like everywhere. And they typically fall into these two branches. So we have abatement or eliminations. And that is when we eliminate, so remove um, sources of carbon emissions within your operation and value chain, so things that you have control over. The other branch of this tree is offsets. And offsets can mean two things. So either you have avoidance or compensating, where you're basically paying someone else to not emit carbon. So that's outside of your value chain and operations. Lastly, we have neutralization or removal, where you quite literally suck carbon out of the atmosphere by, for example, planting trees uh, or building huge fans like the ones they have in Iceland. Um, and then you remove carbon from the atmosphere, either outside of your value chain or within your value chain. And why do we separate them? They, they sound kind of same, same, but they're different, different. And that is because they relate differently to the goals we have set as a global community to reach the 1.5 centigrade um, curb according to the Paris Agreement by 2045. Because if you're aiming to be carbon neutral, it's enough that you match your total overall emissions with um, emission offsets. But for net zero, Offsets is not enough. You need to eliminate emissions within your own value chain and operation. Some say as much as possible, others say 90%, um, which is a pretty high number. And you can only offset the rest. So it's important to understand, especially if your company has uh, 
a target to hit one of these uh, goals, what they mean to you and what they mean to your code. If you thought that was fun, but this was way too short, I have good news for you. Uh, the Linux Foundation have a free course called Green Software Practitioners for Practitioners course. It's an introductory course to green software. Um, you can go check it out for free. I'm also talking tomorrow at 9 if you want to learn more about how this relates to AI. So just to try and summarize what we learned in this very short amount of time. We learned that software has a role to play in the climate solution, and what that role is, is up to us. We also learned that green software is carbon efficient by being energy efficient, hardware efficient, and carbon aware. And lastly, we looked at the green software software carbon intensity specification that you can use to assess the carbon score of your product already today. Thank you so much. <laughs>